Hey there. So, um, it's a pretty cold winter, Sunday. Some call it spring, I don't. Um, so I figured maybe today was a good time to talk about some of the things that I do at work. I work here at a lab at the University of Delaware School of Marine Science and Policy in Lewis, Delaware. And uh, we just got done a week of field work, which I finally documented, so here we go. And a quick disclaimer here that the opinions in this video are my own and don't represent those of the University of Delaware or the U.S. government who fund some of the work that we do. We took a trip to the Potomac River, which is close to Washington, D.C. in the United States. And we went there to study something called UXO, which is a nicer sounding way of calling unexploded ordnance which is a nicer way of saying live munitions that the U.S. military and others have fired or lost in some way directly into the Potomac River. So we went down to a field site on the river to look at how these UXO change over time in a riverine setting. So a lot of them are sitting on the bottom and they're moving with things like storm events, high river outflow, things like floods. So we want to look at how they move over time so we set up a little study there. And I should also mention that this study is funded by the federal government so that they can better and more efficiently clean up the who knows how many UXO that are still on the bottom of the Potomac as well as the Chesapeake Bay and loads of other sites throughout the United States. Public service announcement here. These UXO are highly dangerous and can be found literally anywhere, not just in a marine setting. So if you come across one of these, and let me actually go grab one. Okay, so if you find these are really heavy, I'm gonna make it quick. If you find anything that looks like this out in the water, if you're fishing, you pull it up in a net, or if you're out on the beach and you see something that looks anything like this, Immediately call 911. I gotta put these down. Immediately call 911 or your local law enforcement, or if you're out at sea, obviously call the Coast Guard. They have ways to dispose of these objects without causing harm to you or anybody else near you. All right, so how do we study where those things are moving? Well, here enter our entire UD lab team. <laughs> oh, I'm mic'd up! <laughs> Two boats and so much gear. So much gear. Dude, don't tell me. First, Evan, who is the captain of one of UD's research vessels, the Joanne Daver. Me on film, bud. I ain't signed shit. Break my camera already. And I took the Daver from. Lewis, all the way up the Delaware Bay, through the CNE Canal, down the Chesapeake, and then up the Potomac for, uh, to get the neighbor to our dock. We managed to time it against the tide for pretty much the entire trip, so that was pretty sick, but we got it there. We had to bring a large buoy, a bunch of clump weights, and some surrogate munitions um, on the boat with us because they were too heavy to load at the dock at the field site, so we had to load them with some heavier equipment here in Lewis. We met the rest of my lab there at the field site where they brought another boat and a trailer full of field equipment. Good job. Good job. That went perfectly. So I should probably explain this study. What we're doing here is we're going to monitor a bunch of these surrogate munitions or inert dummy munitions over a six week period. That basically involves us putting them in the water in a predetermined array shape, seeing where they go, relating that to environmental conditions, and then pulling them back out, cleaning everything up. But the seeing where they go part is actually not that simple because the Potomac is nothing like a lot of places in the world where you can look down 20 feet and see everything on the bottom. It's very murky, very turbid, and so we have to use some special instrumentation to be able to see where they go and effectively map all of that as it happens. So what we do here instead is we deploy the surrogates and then map them with sonar, and then wait for that six week period to go up, map it again, 
and then pull them out. So this week we did the first part of that. So we mapped everything, we deployed all of the surrogates, we deployed the acoustic receiver array where all of the um, instruments are located to actually track those surrogates, and then remapped, deployed the environmental sensors, and made sure everything was in the correct place. Then we wait six weeks, we map again, and we pull all of the environmental equipment and the surrogates. The acoustic receivers tell us where and when the surrogate munitions move, and by relating that to the data that's collected by all the environmental equipment, we can better determine what types of events or environmental parameters are associated with movement and what type of movement that these surrogate munitions exhibit. So first we map. We split it into two surveys. The first was with uh, pole mounted sonar and that gives us really good positioning down to about two to four centimeters. And then the other survey that we did was one with an autonomous underwater vehicle. And that gives us much better resolution than the whole mounted sonar survey. And it also gives us really, really good imaging. So we can really see the type of sediment and where everything is, is landed. After the surveys were over, the time came to prep all of the surrogate munitions. 60260. Carter and Katie here are placing acoustic tags in each end of the surrogates that help the underwater receivers track where the surrogates move while the other crew finished up with the sonar survey. Dude, don't tell me. So he needs a 
crew had uh, about a three hour drive back to Delaware. Evan and I had a very different situation unfolding ahead of us. We got pretty humbled in the Chesapeake to close out the trip, but it was still a really good one. I hope you enjoy this look into oceanography and there will be more soon. Thanks for watching. We didn't quite make it home. Um, it's very windy out there. I'm not sure if you can hear it. So we ended up having to stop overnight in the Chesapeake Bay at a marina called Libby's. And we're just gonna leave the boat here until things shape up for the second half of the transit home. So in the meantime, I've got 24 hours back home. I'm gonna drive home and then going on another trip. So stay tuned, I'll see you soon.